And there was about, I don't know, uh, it seemed to me about 20 people, and a few of us uh, decided, oh, we should go out for a beer tonight. Why not? So we went to the Madison Oyster Bar, when it was still down <laughs> yeah. in Madison. Yeah. Uh -huh. It was an old building, it's a beautiful old building. Um, <clears throat> the two reasons why it's memorable uh, for me. Oh, you didn't need the oysters. No, we oh. didn't need the oysters. <laughs> Joe was there. Yeah, right. And I, 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 Anne was in that group, were you? Yeah, I was. That's right. I was going to say maybe we're the only two, but no, Anne was there. I, um, but uh, I had a three month old baby at the time. <laughs> So in his car seat, in we march to the oyster bar. <laughs> he sits on the middle of the table. We're there for ah, at least a couple hours, spending <laughs> our money. And just when we're leaving, the manager comes up and says, what kind of a parent are you? You know kids can't be in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> we always took them out with us when we were in Boston. You know. <laughs> and, uh, was part of the orientation. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, he, uh, yeah, actually, he probably was. He ended up going to IU and graduating. So, <laughs> 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 uh, okay, so that was my uh, personal uh, <coughs> introduction. Uh, uh, but I have been delighted to be Joe's colleague for these 25 or more years. Uh, and uh, so it is really a pleasure that I get to introduce him today. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Joe is a professor of English. His specialty is Renaissance literature, uh, especially Shakespeare. And uh, <coughs> Joe has been helping students understand uh, Shakespeare's plays and poems for over 25 years now. Uh, and uh, one of his favorites is a graduate seminar on how to talk about books you haven't read. <laughs> Hamlet is one of the books that is read or not read. Um, and uh, he's also an active contributor to Shakespeare scholarship. Uh, I, I just printed off the front part of his CV uh, because I confirmed that it was 1993, uh, and so this was your first job after uh, you left mm -hmm. So Joe got his uh, bachelor's in English uh, um, from Beloit College, and then his, uh, his master's and PhD at UC Irvine. Irvine. Irvine, yeah. Washington, I think. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, he has been teaching uh, here uh, for, for the, uh, since then, and uh, he's, uh, has, has contributed lots of articles uh, <coughs> uh, ranging from Shakespeare's place in, in history to rhetoric to cross-dressing in The Merchant of Venice um, and to Hamlet in Hong Kong. Uh, and that's an essay that addresses the role uh, uh, Shakespeare, of Shakespeare's famous play in general education. Uh, Joe was also the first director of our general education uh, and uh, numerous other uh, posts. He's uh, uh, the current director of the MLS program and has been doing that for about eight years. Eight years, yes. Yeah, so, uh, so obviously as well as the scholarship, he contributes uh, a lot of service to the campus. And, uh, um, and uh, Joe has, uh, has over 40 poems that have been published. Uh, and I see you all, all the time now. You were on our kudos today, I think. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, still going strong. Uh, and uh, I think most of us know uh, Joe's voice from the Michiana Chronicles. <coughs> and you have contributed, I, just a quick count, was over 100 of those. So that, that's great. And uh, so, um, I'd like to introduce then a true Renaissance man. <laughs> so today I'm going to be doing some things I normally don't do, but as I normally in class will not read from a text, but I'll be doing doing that. Uh, and uh, normally, and I'm not a PowerPointer, but I couldn't subject you to this without some images mm -hmm. to keep you going and and uh, food helps too, I'm sure. Um, but I, I want to give you some sense of the style of the work I do, and also since we're crossing disciplines and not all of you do English studies, obviously, uh, it might be helpful just to sort of 
think about what constitutes knowledge in a different field. And so I, I want to, to talk about that a bit probably at the end, but, but just to, at this point to say that uh, um, we tend in English studies to begin with a supposition. So like, what if we read this text in this way, in this context? Uh, and then there's a bit of a process of discovery where you're reading the text in that uh, context and, and you see things differently. And uh, I think that makes it unlike so many other disciplines where uh, you have an object that you're pursuing and researching and you kind of know what it is or you have a hypothesis. And here it's not so much about a hypothesis as it is about a kind of uh, toss of the dice. Uh, you might have some intuition, uh, but, but there's also this kind of uh, element of chance as you get into the text, which are themselves so complex that finding your way through and making sense of it is not always possible. So it's kind of the unreadability aspect. And in this case, the to be or not to be speech, you know, it's so familiar, it's performed all the time. But it's also puzzling. And, and so you'll have different theater groups <coughs> coming up with different ways of doing it. It's, it's almost a challenge to make it fresh. And, and so we'll first just, we'll see, I'm not sure how clearly this will show that, um, this film, but we're just going to watch Olivier first give the speech. And he's actually not speaking. I mean, he is speaking, but he, he, the picture just shows his head. You know, his lips aren't moving because it, these are thoughts. So the, the decision here was to make it not a soliloquy in the usual way, but, but really kind of what a soliloquy is supposed to be in modern terms, which is just thinking out loud, thinking, so it's just thinking about things. And thinking is maybe at the center of my talk, too, just the, the notion that what we're doing here uh, in this play at this point is thinking. I don't know if the sound depends upon anything more than <coughs> this machine. Let me turn this on. Okay, yeah. shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause 
There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contemplate. The pangs of despised love. The law's delays. The insolence of office. And the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. When he himself might his quietus make. With a bare vodka. Who would fardels bear? To grunt and sweat under a weary life but that the dread of something after death. The undiscovered country from whose bourne no traveler returns puzzles the world and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not. conscience that make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sickly over with the pale past of thought. And enterprises of great pith and moment, with this regard their currents turn awry. And lose the name of action. Well, I'm not going to be focusing on the entire speech, but you can have it in front of you and you can talk about it at the end if you, if you want. Really, I'm trying to focus <coughs> primarily on the first line, which is in some ways the most puzzling piece. Um, so to be or not to be, that is the question. The opening line of Hamlet's fourth soliloquy was difficult to interpret. Even within the familiarizing frame of its quotability, it remains mysterious, concealing more than it reveals. On the one hand, it is so familiar, so memorable, that it can hardly be heard afresh. But that isn't the only obstacle we must overcome on the way to an interpretation. Here it is not a question merely of hearing the line again. Although our reading is made all the more challenging by our easy assumption of familiarity, the line itself remains essentially difficult. That difficulty has to do with its status as an event. There's a concept I'll work on for a bit later. Something happens in this line, or by virtue of this line, that opens up new possibilities for literature and for thinking. To be or not to be announces a beginning. But the iconic status of the line has obscured its significance at the same time that it has inscribed within the line significance and value beyond any literary meaning. To be or not to be has become a kind of monument. So, an iconic line, oops, sorry. An iconic line, a monument, and also an event. As a consequence of its elevated cultural status, we receive the line now as if it were already well understood and not in need of explication or comment. In this way, the most remarkable line in Shakespeare's oeuvre may go essentially unremarked. Certainly it suffers from what we might call the Mona Lisa effect. 
a veiling effect of iconic familiarity. This effect must be diminished if we are to make progress in reading the soliloquy. Just as Leonardo's great painting can hardly be seen any longer, but is obscured precisely because it gives itself to be seen everywhere. So Hamlet's line cannot be heard because its echo is heard everywhere, ensuring easy recognition in advance. The vital, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what is most strange is that this line does not seem very strange to us. The vital sense of the line retreats within its celebrity status. As with the meaning of the Mona Lisa in the context of Leonardo's genius, so the meaning of the phrase to be or not to be has been contained and concealed by Hamlet's own iconic status and perhaps Shakespeare's as well, and Shakespeare the bard. He's just the poet, he's not anyone in particular. We commonly think of Hamlet as indecisive, <coughs> self-doubting, and philosophical to a fault. He is precisely the character one would expect to speak such a line. And in retrospect, it seems only natural that he would. The phrase, in some sense, is the character Hamlet has become to be or not to be. A celebrity work tends to provoke parody, both as a substitute for thinking and also as a way of bypassing the obstacle to thinking, a way of opening up new interpretive possibilities. The mustache drawn on the Mona Lisa a playful attack on its iconic status takes the place of, an, of any conventional interpretation of the painting as a work of art. We have the Duchamp the representation. The mustache <coughs> also, it's, it's really a kind of a goatee. It's Shakespeare. Yeah. Um, such, such parody is a reaction to the sense that criticism is no longer possible where fascination and reverence hold sway. The temptation is to smash the idol, as happened in Robert Fall's 1985 punk production of Hamlet at Chicago's Wisdom Bridge Theater, where the young actor never speaks the phrase, but instead spray paints to be slash not to be on the back wall, then whirls around towards the audience and exclaims, that is the question. It's like just kind of taking the whole phrase out of the realm of speech. That is the question. Such an act of irreverence is at the same time a moment of revelation and recognition. Fall's production refuses to voice the phrase, just as the mustache calls attention to the masculinity of Mona Lisa's, Mona Lisa's gaze. So in this instance, Punk Hamlet's turning away from the iconic phrase calls attention to the odd emphasis of the subsequent independent clause. That is the question. Note that the phrase, to be or not to be, is not presented in the form of a question at all, but merely identified as such after the fact, after the cesura, that is the question. The famous question that seizes our attention is first of all an answer to a prior question that is only implied. And this is where I'm taking a kind of risk by making a, a, a sort of supposition here. Uh, only applied, namely, what is the question? Understood as a question, to be or not to be, is fundamental. Hamlet presents it as the first serious question, the most pressing of all questions that have occupied him. It is inescapably the question to be fought. But it isn't a question until the following clause names it as such. And from where does that implicit or prior question originate? 
who's, who speaks the question that calls Hamlet to the question of being? It seems to come from nowhere. And it, is no, it has no definite prompt. If we imagine that, this, that his thoughts have already taken a suicidal turn, and, and in the, the, the uh, uh, Olivier version is somewhat prejudicial in this way, where he pulls out the knife very early on. And so you can kind of see, okay, I see this interpretation. He's, stand, he's at the edge of a precipice. He could easily jump into the water. All of that is kind of you know, prescripted into the, the scene. If we imagine that his thoughts have already taken a suicidal turn, we still cannot account for the terms of the, of the dichotomous question. It's attention to being. The problem is not solved if we, po if we suppose that Hamlet has been poring over a book, as might be represented in, in performance. Whoops. Oh, I want to show you these first. Okay, these are just other images of the Mona Lisa, where you can see somebody working with uh, this image, but transforming it. But it opens itself to, up to this transformation, because it's kind of like a challenge. What do you make of this painting? And then, uh, uh, I don't know if you know Grumpy Cat, but, but uh, you know, when, when this image was made of Grumpy Cat, it struck me as like, that is Grumpy Cat. I mean, Grumpy Cat is also like, what is Grumpy Cat really thinking? Like Mona Lisa, who's always smiling, Grumpy Cat is always frowning. Yeah. So it, it's like, uh, you could say, it's more about Grumpy Cat's being than about any particular attitude that he has. And so maybe there is a, a, another connection between Hamlet and the Mona Lisa. And then, uh, <laughs> This is at, at 23 in, in Ironwood, right, you know, near the market, uh, the frame shop. And uh, just yesterday, I finally managed to go over and take the photo. But, but it struck me as uh, interesting, not only because here the Mona Lisa represents painting, so any painting, uh, like the, the painting itself, but also it's like anything that's framed. So like you, you could say, about anybody's little trinket uh, that they're going to put a frame around. Oh, I said, that's your Mona Lisa. You know, that you're showing that you see it as something really beyond value by putting a frame around it. And then here, uh, th this is uh, you know from uh, South America. It's just an image on a wall. That is, the, this guy just took the photo. Of the and I found it on. And this uh, image is um, um, Hamlet, uh, to be or not to be, uh, in Spanish. And, uh, and then notice he's got the, the skull. So that also is another iconic thing about Hamlet. But here it gets mixed up with this earlier speech. So this, that's not the scene in which the skull really figures. But again, it's like Hamlet is just this image, not really a play at all. So reading the play becomes very difficult. And here's where I thought we were a moment ago. So here's uh, Olivier with, with a book. And one could say that, and could represent Hamlet walking through the castle with a book, and then having it occur to him this question to be or not to be. So this problem is not solved if we suppose that Hamlet has been poring over a book that might be represented in performance. If his reading prompts the question, it doesn't formulate it. The text cannot by itself prepare the way for such a question. Supposedly, he's not reading Heidegger, in other words. <laughs> Something else is going on. Something must have happened within Hamlet's mind to give rise to this precise question as a serious question, the most serious, whether in response to an internal or an external discourse. To leap ahead, as we are always tempted to do when we take for granted the familiarity of the line, we might say that to be to, or not to be is a question about life and death, living or not living suicide or survival. 
But this indication, what it is about, is not yet before us. <coughs> Here it is a question of being, and, uh, and of the distinction between being and not being. The excitement of the line, the sense of daring that it evokes, resides in its supreme abstraction, to be or not to be. This is to speak both of existence and of being, but first of all of being. The infinitive to be is also the noun being, esse, the to be. To <coughs> be or not to be. You see this is like one word, to be or not to be. Being or not being. For Hamlet, the question is not simply whether to go on living. First of all, he is asking whether it is possible to be, whether it is possible to have being or to participate in being. Do we automatically have being? Can one be? Can one choose to be? Are we doomed merely to exist and not to be? Or is it possible to be, to live truly and authentically? For instance, that could be one way of thinking about it. The prior question, what is the question, is urgent, but, is not, but it is not the kind of question that everyone is prepared to hear. The question of the question is the most general and preliminary of all questions. It is as if it were spoken from off stage by a ghost. But if so, this is a ghost of the future not of the past. It is the haunting of a spirit that has not yet been born. The question that calls for questioning calls from the future. If the question calls from within Hamlet himself, that inner voice calls to Hamlet from his own future. First of all, it destines Hamlet to be the one who questions being. At one as one, at one of the origins of the Renaissance, at the threshold of modernity. So one of my, there's like a larger thesis here that you may not perceive right away, which is that we can see Hamlet as caught between two epochs. That, that is, he belongs to, and his connection to his father is a connection to the medieval period. Uh, and his questioning, just, just speaking of questioning, not necessarily um, to be or not to be, but his, his questioning in general is um, a modern thing. So it's, it's like he's a pre-modern, post-medieval at the same time. And this is the nature of his difficult mental and emotional problem. How, can he obey his father? Uh, you know, could you, if your father told you to kill somebody, could you do it because it was your father? I think most modern people would say, no, that's, you know, I, I would at least want to investigate whether this person is worthy of being you know, whether it's going to be worth my time to do it, and, and suffering that I'll have to do it. So, if it were only a matter of a question, any old question, the prompt would need to be more specific. But this answering question, to be or not to be, is the question among questions. The most general question calls for the one question among all questions. In the most general question, modernity speaks. What is the question? Normally, you would just you'd have an answer in mind. I mean, if you were a scholastic philosopher, you would you would know what the question was to begin with. Opening the way of questioning, and to be precise, opening the way of an open-ended questioning. The ghost of the father, the ghost of the past, on the other hand, demands action and obedience. It speaks commandments. It is the voice of command invoking duty. The ghost of the future and of modernity makes an entirely different kind of demand. The question of being is inescapable, but this isn't to say that we don't attempt to escape. Or that life, or here, the act of reading, itself isn't characterized by such an attempt. 
The fearful aspect of the question is its unanswerable nature. The rest of the speech, as engaging as it is, does not echo in our minds with the resonance of the first line. Instead, this original thought recedes from us, and perhaps from Hamlet too, almost immediately, as Hamlet turns to the existential question of life and death. Not, ne not necessarily right away to suicide either, because he, the, the speech is really remarkable for being impersonal. You know, so there is this idea in, in the Renaissance of like the question of debate. You know, the, the Renaissance people were very much into rhetoric, and, and that was about uh, often about debate and speaking from different perspectives and so forth on a particular topic. Um, and uh, uh, so Hamlet seems to sort of become a bit of a schoolboy in the rest of the speech. Not uh, that's not to lower him, but because these are very difficult questions and they're important, and they're central to his own concerns. But he's, he has a sort of scholarly approach, or philosophical approach, to the, the position that he finds himself in. So instead, this original thought recedes from him, and perhaps, uh, recedes from us, and perhaps from him. Thus, the next line comes as an explication of the question. That's just a little illustration of it. But even here, Hamlet, Hamlet's discourse is general and philosophical rather than being focused on the particular problem that has oppressed him since his encounter with his father's ghost. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing in them. In the face of misfortune, it is, better to, is it better to be passive and accepting or active and resistant? Activity, ironically, may lead to death. The one reading of that line is that, of course, trying to fight against a sea, and we take that metaphor very seriously, if we do, then fighting against a sea of troubles is a doomed enterprise. The sea of troubles is inexorable. It's an inexorable, tragic force that threatens all of us with destruction. These are also the circumstances in which the question about being has its meaning. Are we, are we puppets of fate? Or do, do our actions have meaning? In the face of death that is inevitable for each of us, can we meaningfully exert our own will? So not death itself, not, not necessarily Hamlet's death. What sense does it make to take arms against this overwhelming force of destruction? I think you can kind of hear in there, the, if you read it in a certain way, the sense that, that underneath this direct concern about confronting the sea of troubles is the more basic concern of confronting death itself, which tends to have a negating force. The more you think about it, it's like, so I'm going to die in 10 years? So what's the point? If, if somebody could tell you the date of your death, it would be disturbing because it would make it more real to you. And then you'd have to really kind of rethink what you're doing. Uh, whereas we live in such a way where we know we're going to die, but, but not now. And so even on your deathbed, you'll be saying, I still have time. Or, or Ken tells a story about his grandmother, was it, who, who, when she was quite old, decided she wanted to learn how to drive. Okay. Too late. I mean, really, for that, too late. Uh, but, but she's still, you know, she's still young in her head. We're all still young. Old Hamlet is the will of history, the power of tradition to which Hamlet must submit 
if he is to remain faithful to the past, to his family, to his culture. Hamlet's meeting with the ghost at the end of Act One is the moment in Shakespeare's tragedy that describes a compulsion. And in fact, the scene in which Hamlet hears from the ghost the tale of his murder at the hands of his own brother, and in which the ghost demands revenge, this entire scene displays the terrible force that works upon Hamlet's mind, reducing him to the call of vengeance, binding him to his supposed fate. Thus, immediately after the ghost's departure, his words are, the ghost says, remember me. Hamlet swears to give his life over fully to revenge. So there's no uncertainty about this, at least in the way it says it. Remember thee? I, poor ghost, whilst memory holds a seat in this distracted globe. The head in his mind. Remember thee? Yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe all, away all trivial fond records, all saws of books, all forms, all pressures past that youth and observation copy there. And thy commandment, all alone, shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. It's a pretty absolute statement. The Father's demand is a commandment. And his exhortation, remember me, recalls Christ's words at the Last Supper. Hamlet swears to take revenge on his uncle, the present King Claudius, and thereby fulfill his duty to his father, keeping his father's memory in effect. The promise implies self-abnegation. He promises to become the pure instrument of his father's will. Such is the traditional role of the faithful son a relationship that reflects the ideal of service in Western societies until really the 18th century. The king, the father, commands, like God, and the people, the children, obey. In the kingdom, only the king is sovereign. In the family, only the father commands. Others are judged by their obedience. This is a case in which Taking arms against a specific source of trouble is a practical matter. In this earlier speech, Hamlet conforms to the cultural ideal. But his language reveals further cultural implications. His commitment is like a spiritual conversion. In order to host this one demanding memory, he must set aside other present concerns. And more than that, he must eradicate his personal past, erasing his previous learning, including his observations, a term with scientific implications. The, these he now must judge to be base because they do not contribute to the mission of revenge. As a student at Wittenberg, ground zero of the Protestant Reformation, Hamlet would presumably have been introduced to modern intellectual and scientific trends. But his sudden commitment to revenge turns back the clock, placing him once again within the medieval scholastic tradition of patriarchal authority and the culture of absolutism. His initial dutiful response to the traditional, to, to, is a traditional response, rather, of the hero of popular revenge tragedy. What is strange and new about Hamlet is that the overpowering motive of revenge ultimately does not program his behavior and determine the shape of the tragedy, despite his initial enthusiasm. Something new happens, as we begin to see only a short time later. And at the end of the scene, uh, when reflecting on the ghost's terrible revelations, Hamlet complains. <coughs> The time is out of joint. O oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. This kind of complaint is not uh, what his father wants. This is one of the many places in the play 
where we might remark the advent of modernity. Here Hamlet emphasizes his personal suffering above his filial duty. Strangely, from a medieval or a Renaissance perspective on revenge, he sees himself as the victim rather than the agent of fate. The subjunctive expression that ever I was born to expresses the wish to have had things turn out differently, implying an ambivalence regarding the call to action. On the one hand, it may be, it may be a high calling to repair uh, what, was, what has been broken in the state of Denmark. Uh, here we have the image of Hamlet as a doctor kind of setting a dislocated bone. Uh, to have been born into this role is to have been singled out as the man who is equal to the heroic task. In addition, it may be psychologically reassuring to have been assigned a clear mission of purpose in life. That is, it may be a blessing to know one's fate and to accept one's destiny. That's one answer to that problem of confronting death. At last, I know my life's purpose. What I was born to do, he might explain. Now everything makes sense. As a result of the fateful call, Hamlet's earlier sense of powerlessness and his growing hatred of Claudius are suddenly comprehensible. Now his hatred seems justified. But on the other hand, even in the face of such strong reasons for taking revenge, the call to vengeance causes him anguish rather than relief because it directs him so forcefully. This commandment causes him to re regret his own birth, to wish himself outside of being. Almost immediately, after promising to avenge his father's murder, he reveals a reluctance to fulfill his duty. As we know, Hamlet proves to be not quite up to the task that fate has assigned him. The mystery of Hamlet's play, of Shakespeare's play, is why, given such strong motives for revenge, Hamlet is unable to act. This problem mystifies Hamlet, who on several occasions chides himself for his inaction. In Act 4, when he observes the army of Fortinbras, the young, active Norwegian prince, marching to, to battle, against Poland over the worthless scrap of land. He expresses his envy of the soldiers because they seem to act so decisively. Rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument, but greatly to find quarrel in a straw when honor's at stake. How stand I then that have a father killed, a mother stained, excitements of my reason and my blood, and let all sleep, while to my shame I see the imminent death of 20,000 men that for a fantasy and trick of fame go to their graves like beds. See, these men who are soldiers, in his mind, they're at peace with their lives. They're about to die for nothing but they're at peace because they've got this kind of sense of purpose, which is absolute. They know. And Hamlet is always questioning and doesn't know. So you have these moments in the play where he'll say, I don't know. That is a modern moment. Because all questions should have answers from a medieval point of view. Until you just you work until you find them. But then there's also just this kind of sense of being that we live as modern people, never quite knowing who we are, never knowing where we're going, what it all means. Unless we can latch on to some belief system, some old-fashioned belief system, where we no longer have to search anymore. We, we, can, we can be uh, at home and at peace with, with a way of, of seeing. So I'm, I'm going to uh, stop the, the reading at this point because I can I think in question and answers, say some other things that will fill, fill you in on, um, on the play and, and on my thinking about other plays, like Macbeth, for instance, uh, as a, an example. So I see Hamlet is a, 
a Machiavellian character because he questions power and is not, uh, he's precisely not a, a monarchical thinker. thinker. Uh, he's more scientific about politics. And uh, uh, somebody like Macbeth wants to believe that he is an absolute monarch, and that's part of his problem from Shakespeare is that he's not really able to succeed at that. Because it's impossible. In Shakespeare's view of the world, it's impossible to be successful if you totally believe in something. So thank you. Moderate my yeah. questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I, that way, I can avoid the really tough questions. <laughs> my question. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's what we're talking about: is avoiding a question. <laughs> to be or not to be. Uh, you know, any. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts also just about the Mona Lisa effect kind of thing. That's that's my tip of the hand to something sort of popular culture oriented that <clears throat> they were really talking about celebrity as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it, it's a, a refuge in a way is what I'm saying. Philosophically I'd be saying that's a, a kind of refuge in a world where we don't have many refuges from the question. Uh, if, you, if you can idolize a celebrity then you've got kind of focus in life and somebody to look up to, and that person can do no wrong. Of course, until they do wrong, and then you beat them into the ground, right? And replace them with somebody else who really is authentic until you beat them into the ground, etc. So it is this kind of continual, but never fully, in our world, never fully successful escape from a kind of questioning that um, makes us uncomfortable, you know, keeps us uncomfortable. So if, so if you live in a, you feel like anxious all the time, I would say that's normal. That's you're a modern person. That that's just the way it is. I'm sorry, but you, there's no escape. That's just the way it is. Now, Pat. So you're ashamed to have no idea about the answer to this. Do we have any clue how did Shakespeare's audience receive Hamlet when it was first performed? Do we have any idea how people reacted? It, it's hard to. See. Say that there, it would be. This is one of my fantasies to go back in time and actually, you know, see the play performed. How was it originally performed? You know, what were some of the choices that were made? But also talk to people in the audience. But but um, there's nothing like a, a reader response record uh, there. And the best we have are these uh, pirated versions of the text that get things wrong. And so maybe you could speculate based upon what they get wrong, what they thought of the play. But there are many mysteries like this about him, I mean, about Shakespeare and his theater. For instance, uh, imagine um, a play where a young man is playing the role of Juliet in Romeo and Juliet. And yet, there's nothing farcical about that play. We're supposed to fall in love with Juliet. So, you know, suspension of disbelief, maybe partly, but also maybe just really good, convincing acting, um, good makeup. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you, you're left kind of speculating about what's going on inside the mind of, of people. But my, my own speculation would be that with the to be or not to be speech, people are, are not hearing the be question of being. So my argument is not that this is what people would hear. In fact, my argument about Shakespeare in general is that he's speaking to the future, not to his present. And so the reason Hamlet is in that class about not reading is my, my it's, first of all, it's in this book, which I recommend by Pierre Bayard, How to Talk About Books You Have Read, which is the title of my, my course, too. But, uh, also, I'm talking there about how we can never fully read or finally read Hamlet. So you can read an instruction manual and you can have it in your head. 
but this is a, a problem in general with literature that's still alive for us, is that it's speaking to us in a really meaningful way because we can't master it. And, and Shakespeare is still smarter than we are in some sense. Shakespeare, I mean, uh, this is not a person ultimately, it's, it's the imagination of a person. So it's more than the person. It's like Shakespeare's writing out of his unconscious as much as out of his conscious mind. So you should, as a creative writer, be smarter on the page than you are in person. <laughs> I think that is the general rule. Uh, and uh, so we can never have read Hamlet. Uh, that's why we reread it. You know, somebody could say to me, why are you rereading Hamlet for the 12th time, <coughs> or the 20th time? It's like, didn't you read it well the first time? But even if you memorized it, you will not have read it. Knowing the line, to be or not to be, is not to understand it clearly. It's just to have it in your head, to think about it. Oh, are there other, I mean, this is sort of not one of my favorite plays, and I wonder whether are there other pl other Shakespeare plays that you view as being on par with this in terms of the issues raised? Or? Yeah, I, so this is the most famous one, yeah. therefore you, you feel, the culture sort of feels like, well, this is the pinnacle. And I think it's probably for these kinds of reasons that I'm talking about, where, where there's some, like, to be or not to be, that speech and even that phrase feel so important, you know, and so you, you feel like, oh, this is, and then, then, then Hamlet himself, he's like thinking through things, and it's hard not to identify with him, and he has so many lines. Um, so it, it's compelling in a way that a, 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 a play that seems to be more of a story maybe isn't. It's more philosophical. Um, but, but yeah, I think the, the Merchant of Venice and Measure for Measure, uh, plays like that that are considered sort of problem plays. They're not, they're not real comedies, but they have happy endings. They're not happy, they're not cheerful comedies, I guess you could say. But they have technically happy endings. But they're endings that are troubled by something ugly. And in the case of The Merchant of Venice, the, uh, the Jew is uh, scapegoated, and he's forced to convert to Christianity. So he's like defeated in himself. But the Christians go away feeling like, well, we did a great job. <laughs> yeah. And so you can see, that's a moment where, going back to Pat's question, you can see how the original audience would, would be happy with that ending. You know, there are very few Jews living in England at that time, and there's already a tradition of treating Jews on the stage as villains. And so they're just an easy kind of target so it makes sense to use such a character. But Shakespeare, it's like Shakespeare can't put out even a character he dislikes, and I'm not sure that he dislikes Shylock, but he can't even write the part of a character he dislikes without giving that person real human characteristics that make you feel like they're given a voice. So women are given a voice, uh, in, in, especially in the comedies. And you feel like, oh, this is a critique of masculine culture. But I'm not sure the original audience would have that view of it. They would just laugh at the funny parts and you know, be happy with outcomes. Um, hmm, how do I ask? <laughs> so uh, one impression I got as part of your, your, your thesis is that there's like a, what makes this, pro this project uh, Modern in the sense is there's this sort of attempt at I, I don't know, that's the right it, but you, you get this sort of uh, epi epistemic angst mm -hmm. right that supposedly in the time period in which it was written maybe that wasn't part of the ethos yeah right so you get the and, and so I guess my question would be um, I mean what 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 would have what would it have been to know at that time, right? I mean, is, is, is our, I mean, do we have some Car Cartesian notion of certainty? And that's what constitutes knowledge, thus that's why we're stuck with this sort of angst? Or, or but because yeah. as, as you read on a little bit in this thing, suddenly the concern is that, you know, well, we, we, 
we'll, we'll put our, you know, we'll put up our umbrellas and let the, all the, the, the rain of life pour on us, right? <laughs> what the hell? Because I don't know what's going I don't know what, what's on the other side. Yeah. Right? So I can, I, I can endure this because it's an odd thing because we endure it. Why do we endure it? Because there's a sense in which we know it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The familiar, even unpleasant familiar thing. Right. So, so this is kind of the way the question was asked. But the, epi in, but, but the epistemic worry, on. It, so there, it, it's, hard, I'm, I'm, it's hard to reconcile. The, there, there seems to be this overarching epistemic worry, which, but where is the worry located? Yeah. Right? Is it in this life, which you might, you, what one claim is to make, well, look, if, you're, if you have all this angst, well, jo join us. Exactly. Don't we all? Right? But the impression I was getting is I thought the angst was about maybe some, you know, the deeper metaphysical worry or, you know, something like that. Yeah. I mean, because to think about, like, right, we say, well, how do we kind of know things? Well, we think, well, we make inferences to the best explanation, right? What, what, what data set makes the, uh, right, what makes the data look least surprising as to which theory we should endorse? Yeah. And we say, well, that's what it means to know, maybe. If yeah. you're giving some deflationary account of knowledge, right? That's not Cartesian. Yeah, I, so I, I have several responses to that. Um, uh, and my mind's sort of spinning about this. But the, Descartes is one of these moments uh, where something happens. And you could say, well, isn't Descartes really moving toward trying to reach a, a sense of certainty? But he's doing it in a way that's new. And he's doing it, first of all, by by trying to get rid of all of the old certainties, which he finds, when he in investigates them, aren't really, so, aren't really certain. So what's modern about Descartes is that investigation. And, and what's modern about Hamlet, in these kind of practical terms, is that he confronted with the ghost. He doesn't just act the way he would in many other tragedies of the period. He has to test Claudius. And so he has this sort of play within the play where he kind of tries to catch the conscience of the king, get his reaction. So it's like he's, a, he's investigating the case. So the medieval view of revenge, insofar as this is kind of like a central thing, the medieval view, you find this in Lord Arthur and places like that, you, know, you have to take revenge when your honor is, is threatened even. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a case where somebody has actually hurt you. Um, if they just insult you, then you've got to kill them. And the weak person questions, the strong person acts, uh, without regard to any consequences. So once we start thinking about consequences, or what, once we start questioning whether it's true, then we're caught in a different kind of world. But for Hamlet, it's more of a problem, because he still believes, at some level, in these old ways of thinking. And so he can't the way you and I could say, well, as much as we'd like to be certain, we're, we have to face the fact that we are. He, he still wants to be certain. So when he sees the, that troop of people moving through the landscape off to battle, he identifies with them. He doesn't really understand fully his own position because, again, this is what I was calling an event. Something's happening that can't be yet defined. It can't be perceived yet as something in and of itself, or something that we would just recognize as, as a concept. It's just an, um, it's just a, you could say, a, a dislocation of what had been taken for granted before. And the nature of that dislocation is, it can be determined, for instance, by thinking about beginning of science or Protestantism as a questioning of uh, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, even translation, the, the multiplication of translations of the Bible, translating the Bible into uh, the vernacular, all of those things are part of the what's happening in the modern world. The printing press, sometimes, sometimes it's the technology that forces these uh, crises that are merely crises at first. They're not problems you can define. So Hamlet can't analyze it. He can only feel it and react. And you see these reactions. He longing for the certainty that used to exist that still is kind of available to him. 
but he's like us in that he can't make himself, this is where Machiavelli comes in, he can't make himself the instrument of somebody else's will. So if I try to persuade you to do something, but the basic message is you're doing it because I told you to do it, you would feel like in your right as a sovereign citizen to resist. Even if I were right, you would resist because, you know, to hell with you, you're not going to tell me what to do. So that's kind of our reaction. Uh, Hamlet's not like some teenager rebelling against his dad. He, he feels what his dad is saying. He feels that duty, that response, that uh, responsibility is not quite the right word, but he feels that, feels that duty for uh, Hamlet. I mean, for Hamlet Sr., we, I would say, are in a world where we don't follow our duty so much. I mean, we do it for trivial matters, but we are responsible rather than dutiful. And responsibility in this sense, the kind of the Derridian sense, is about beginning with uncertainty. So you can only take responsibility. You can only decide the undecidable. You can't decide what's already been decided. Then you're just following the program that's already in existence. This is the, the position a scientist finds him or, herself, him or herself in, where precisely you should question anything that seems too pat, too familiar, and re-question. You know, so people say that this is what you'll find when you look through the microscope. A scientist doesn't say, okay, well, I'll look for that. A scientist has to have the discipline to see what's actually there, to observe. And that takes training, for one thing, but it also takes bravery. You, know, you have to be bold enough to disagree with everybody who came before. And that is part of the history of science. Yeah. So, um, apropos of your talk, uh, I was noticing something in one of your slides that I've never noticed before, even though I've read them like a bazillion times. So on the slide where you were, um, had the passage about uh, where Hamlet was recommitting to his father's, the memory of his father, and like, mm -hmm. he played revenge. He has all that like uh, verbiage about, you know, I'm gonna forget everything I've ever read or I've ever experienced. Yeah. And, um, so as you were talking about Descartes and that tradition, I was like, it, it seems, you know, Descartes, Locke, like kind of that's around the area where we start to get the kind of idea of, you know, experience becoming like so empirical thought right like mm -hmm. the empiricist like what you experience becoming you know, printed on your brain and that kind of becoming the basis for personality as well as personal identity as well as knowledge and it, I, it just kind of really struck me that like wow this passage seemed to really almost be gesturing towards that idea and so i was wondering if you could give us a little context about you know is this kind of a forerunner of that that, that, that philosophy that gets formalized later, or are there um, contemporary contexts that kind of help us see this? Yeah, well, for, for one thing, i just point out that the book and volume of my brain, yeah. the, it's related to their concept of memory. So yes. while, while, while memory holds a seed in this distracted globe, um, that, they, that medieval people generally, thinkers and so forth, thought of the mind as like a book in which all of these things are written down. So there's a real emphasis on memorization. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but what's ironic about this, I think I would say that there's a kind of anti-Cartesian aspect to this, mm -hmm. whereas what he's erasing are the things that he's learned. Yeah. Uh, and those things in his university in Germany uh, would be modern, uh, forms of knowledge that would contradict the father's way of thinking. This father is just a soldier. That's really all he is. He's like this traditional warrior, Beowulf-like you know, figure. And Hamlet is different. So it's like he's uh, raising all of that. But, but, it, but you would think of Descartes, that's about sweeping away the past. Here it's about sweeping away the future so that he can return to this absolute faith and carry out the deed, which otherwise would be hard for him to do. Yeah. So th there's a lot more to be said about the remember yeah. me kind of thing, too. But, but yeah, no, it's an interesting aspect of it. 
And Joe, I think we probably, um, yeah. since we have to, what is it going to be today? 2E or not 2F? <laughs> 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 um, so we'll do that at the, at the meeting. But let's thank Joe again.